Well, yesterday, the Defence Secretary outlined the reasons for this in the House of Commons. Let's take a listen. Sadly, so far, at least 23,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed or wounded, although the actual figure is likely to be substantially higher. Thousands of citizens have been sent to sinister filtration camps before being forcibly relocated to Russia. Some 6,000 children, ranging in ages from four months to 17 years, are now in, quote, re-education camps across Russia. The UN, as well as US investigators, have found that Russia has committed war crimes with reported evidence of executions, torture and sexual violence in civilian areas. Uh, let's talk to defence analyst Chris Newton, who's here. Morning to you, Chris. Morning. Okay. Why is there a need for long-term, long-range missiles to be sent in? Uh, good morning. Um, Effectively, what, why the Ukrainians need it is that, you remember in the summer of 2020, uh, 2022, um, the West gave the Ukrainians um, HIMARS artillery, long-range artillery, um, and that was very effective at you know, destroying command posts, logistics hubs, and so forth. Um, the Russians have learned to place all of those elements away from the range of, the, of this long-range artillery. So the Ukrainians need longer-range weapons. So that's why they need this, um, the, the, these long-range missiles, so that they can target command posts, uh, ammunition depots, but also hard uh, sort of targets as well, bridges, things like that, so that they, they can carry on with that effective... So tell us about the Storm Shadows missiles, because <clears throat> they're quite hefty, aren't they? Yeah, they're 1,300 kilograms. Um, their range is 155 miles. Um, the range of the high Mars is 55 miles, so it gives them a much longer, longer range. And, yeah, they're, they're designed to sort of penetrate and, and hit sort of hard targets, concrete, uh, bunkers, um, big targets, effectively. So, so with that sort of range, the idea is you could, in effect, theoretically, force Russia back to the borders, presumably. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean the other thing you can do with that, with them, is also target Crimea as well, so you yeah. can get kind of really in, into, into the rear and sort of mess about with their logistics and, and, and so forth. Um, it will help them. Advance. I wouldn't say it would help them to advance in one go because there's still a lot of occupied Ukraine to, to recapture. But it will certainly help them in, in terms of disrupting command and control and, and logistics and, and, and other things. Mm. Mm. Um, this comes after a promise from Mr Wallace earlier on in the year that if he continued to see Russian attacks... Um, into Ukraine that we would be sending more weapons and that that promise has now come true hasn't it yeah yeah um, yes and um, you know we, we had a discussion uh, earlier about early in the year about aircraft and, and, and so forth um, and and Wallace actually laid out a clear kind of justification as well it's, it's he, he said he also did this in response to Russian escalation as well in terms of targeting energy um, infrastructure and, mm. and, and their air campaigns against civilian targets as well, and, and also various Russian atrocities and, and so forth. So, mm. so as long as that happens, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to, to send the weapons. Where does this fall within the idea of a spring offensive, at least, which we, we've been told is in the offing, but obviously getting little more than that at the moment? Yeah, to, I mean, to do this now makes sense, you know, for, for a number of reasons. For, firstly, um, because, it was because of the technicalities. The reason why it's taken this long is because you need to fit this, this missile that's made for Western aircraft onto Soviet so aircraft, uh, so, so Soviet era sort of aircraft. So, so you have to do that. But in terms of the counteroffensive, it, it's, it's good for that as well, partly because of what I've said, but, but also. They're, they're using this weapon at the start of the counteroffensive, so that the, the Russians will have to take time in order to develop sort of countermeasures and, and so forth. So if you do it at the start, it, you know, it immediately wrongs, wrong foots the, the Russians. Has the spring offensive already started? Because we're hearing from some Russian bloggers that they're reporting movement of Ukrainian soldiers in Bakhmut. But then President Zelensky, talking to, just this week, said, no, it's too soon, we, we can definitely move forward, but if we do, we're going to have a, a huge loss of life, so we're going to 
sit tight? I mean, that's, that's a good question, because sometimes an offensive starts and everybody knows it starts off with, you know, with a massive kind of operation. But sometimes it begins like the Russian winter offensive. It begins incrementally. Mm. And we're seeing localised counterattacks uh, at the moment from the Ukrainians. Um, whether that indicates the start of the counteroffensive is hard to say at, um, at the moment. What I think is happening is that they, and this is just a guess because we don't know, the fog of war, don't know exactly what's going on, but perhaps what they're doing by attacking in Bakhmut, um, they're, they're kind of forcing the Russians to divert resources from the south, which is where everyone thinks the counterattack is, the, the main attack is going to come, to the east, so that they're, they're kind of, they're forcing the Russians with dwindling manpower to commit in different places, and, and that would hopefully soften up um, for, for uh, the, the, Russian, the Russians in the south for, for a potential main attack. But the main attack could occur somewhere else. Um, just before you go, because we're out of time, really, what do you make of what President Trump was saying this week? Um, I could end this in 24 hours. Now, I heard that and thought, yeah, right, or the other one. It, it, it's... But is there any substance to that? I can talk to the right people, I can stop this in 24 hours. I mean, the thing is, he never says how he's going to do it. And the problem is, is that this is, you know, we're talking about two very different kind of uh, conceptions of international order, two conceptions of what Ukraine should be, an independent country versus, you know, a, Rus a Russian vassal. And that kind of dispute is not going to be resolved easily, and that's why it's ended in war, because, because you have two very different opposing visions. And I can't see how he's going to do it, um, because, because of the nature of the dis dispute, it's visceral. It's as essential for Ukraine. Mm. So, fine, if, you know, if he thinks he's got away, explain. But at the moment, he hasn't explained. Yeah, OK. Chris, good to see you. Thank you very much Thank indeed. Thank you.